Hello, and welcome to Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And this week, it's my pleasure to welcome Scott Gillies, the curator of the Ingersoll Cheese and Agricultural Museum, a winner of Ontario's award for Top Small Museum, also part of Oxford County's Cheese Trail. So please join us as we explore the Ingersoll Cheese and Agricultural Museum with curator Scott Gillies. Well, joining us this week on Ask a Historian is, I was going to say an old friend, but I don't, I don't mean to strike the old part, but uh, a, a friend of us here in Mississauga due to a long association with museums in Mississauga and museums elsewhere. But this is Scott Gillies, the curator of the Ingersoll Cheese and Agricultural Museum in Ingersoll, Ontario. And uh, we're uh, talking to Scott this week as part of International Museums Week. And uh, uh, Scott, uh, and many of our listeners or, you know, many of our, 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 our people out there, members of Heritage Mississauga, we're all cheese fans uh, and, uh, uh, and of some way or another. And, uh, you know, it's just gracious of you to take your time uh, to, to talk with us about uh, your museum uh, and, uh, and uh, what people can see uh, or what, how people can interact now, but what they can see kind of when we return to normal times, whenever that path may be. Uh, but uh, again, thank you, Scott, for, for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Matthew. Yeah. I mean, I don't take too great an offense about the, the old friend. I mean, I'm the older friend, I guess we can say <laughs> safely. Um, and it's nice that we're doing this at the beginning of International Museum Week. Um, we're still in the same country, but um, community-wise, it is like a, 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 a we're worlds apart from uh, you know Peel region to Oxford County, from third was sixth largest city in the in the country to um, to being part of the country. You know, the uh, like Oxford is considered probably the finest agricultural land in all of Canada and that has impacted on uh, agricultural history and economic history as relates to being the dairy capital of Canada and really the, the cradle of the Canadian cheese industry. So. Well, I look forward to exploring that with you because uh, I, I will admit, although I'm, I'm uh, you know, somewhat aware of Oxford's connections to, to dairy and cheese and stuff, I, I really am a neophyte in, in you know, my knowledge of it. I did, I did, we'll talk about this later, but I, I randomly in a, in a used bookstore, I came across uh, Oh Queen of Cheese by James McIntyre. Uh, okay. And uh, maybe the most interesting preface to a book that I've ever come across where it said, possibly Canada's worst poet. But <laughs> the, uh, uh, we'll talk about James and some of his connections uh, a, a little bit later on. But uh, wondering if you can just maybe briefly talk a little bit about your connections here to Mississauga and the path mm -hmm. that you've traveled uh, to uh, to where you are today in Ingersoll. Yeah. Well, I am originally from Oxford County, from Ingersoll. But uh, after I graduated from from Western uh, a few decades ago, um, I had worked at the Agricultural Museum in Milton when it first opened, and uh, and then uh, had an opportunity to actually, I think, be the first costumed interpreter uh, that Bradley Museum hired in about 1983. In those days, Mary Lou Evans was head of um, the City of Mississauga Heritage Department. Vicki Marchant was the assistant curator of Bradley Museum. There was this partnership between the city and Mississauga Heritage Foundation. I mean, I don't need to tell you about the history of the MHF. Um, or the Township of Toronto Heritage Foundation. <laughs> uh, they, they were responsible for the, the restoration, the movement and restoration of Bradley. And so, so Mary Lou, you know, primarily worked in the office. Vicki uh, was looking after the, the museum on her own. So I came in um, to assist her on a part-time basis. Well, at the same time that I was working part-time for for the city that I was still holding down two other part-time jobs. Uh, worked at uh, Mountsburg Conservation Area for the Holton Conservation Authority. Uh, actually um, 
conducting tours of their uh, maple bush. Okay. And um, and then. Aimed uh, to naturally flow. Well, I just kind of got settled in uh, doing all these parts. Curator of the Norwich Museum, then in Norwich, Ontario, which was a tremendous opportunity. You know, we went through uh, a, a building project and uh, put a, a huge addition onto the old Quaker meeting house for that. Then uh, other things happened. I got to go out to Winnipeg for uh, for a year on a um, museum training program, only offered to three people a year across Canada. So that was tremendous. Wow. Um, some time at Southampton for the Bruce Kennedy Museum. Then I got the chance to come back to Mississauga and be the the curator of the Bradley Museum. So that was in 1988. And uh, I stayed in Mississauga, stayed working for Mississauga, either for the MHF or the city or back and forth a couple of times. <laughs> and then, um, you know, that continued until 2006. So, uh, so during that time, I um, was able to draw upon my experience at Norwich with the, the building construction that we did there when it came time to renovate and restore the anchorage. So, uh, and that was that was a cool project because, you know, Susan Steen was the executive director of the MHF uh, when I first started in 88. And so like Susan had a background in fundraising. So, so we were able to, to raise the necessary monies to proceed with the project. And then Gabe Pepin came in and took over as ED. So, um, remember, you know, long nights, the two of us scraping and cleaning floors on the second floor of the anchorage and, and getting it ready and, and working with folks like uh, like Jenny Dale to organize a, a designer showcase before the, the building opened. So then we got all the rooms decorated really at no cost. And then it was a bit of a fundraiser again for the MHF. So then when we opened it, um, Mary McCallion uh, came and opened it. You know, she did say, okay, well, this, this will do as a, a museum until we get a better one. And so <laughs> that love is. Um, and, uh, and I would did things like introduce Maple Magic as a special event uh, that I understand is still going. So that's, that's kind of nice to see that they've been able to continue that program. Um, we knew at the time that it had that it had good legs that it could become a, a major event uh, when you start to see you know thousands of people coming for the the one week then that was uh, reassuring that we'd made the right choice there so uh, I mean I was really fortunate to have had that experience in Mississauga um, getting to kind of work, shoulder to shoulder with with the MPP, Margaret Marland, and she was around. She used to love coming to, to cook hot dogs during our fall fair event, right? Um, Councillor Mullen, Pat Mullen was a tremendous asset to the museum and to myself personally. Getting to, to meet some of the others, you know, Steve Mahoney when he was MP, and Maya Prentice, who was another councillor, come to mind. You know, like Paul Sipos, who was on the board of management for Bradley Museum. Um, and we, we were going through the, the process of, of getting approvals from the ministry for the Anchorage project. Um, we had hired Chris Borgle as the, the architect. But uh, you know, we had a meeting in uh, one of the ministry offices in Toronto, and they were saying, oh, you know, we're concerned about your your plans, you know, we don't want to see the building ruined or destroyed or altered in any way. And, and uh, you know, they were just this young architect who was employed by the ministry was going on and on about all of his concerns. And then Paul simply um, spoke up. He said, well, I'm a professional architect too. And it was like a mic drop moment. And so 
everything changed then. So we were able to proceed and go through all the, the hoops and hurdles um, and uh, finally get it open. So. And not the, not the only building you had to uh, oversee the, uh, the uh, I guess, the opening or the, the rejuvenation of with the log cabin project as well. Yes, yes, did a lot of work on uh, coming up with the, the plans for that building yeah. and uh, helping with the fundraising on that project. Um, again, that was, was a lot of fun too. Getting to, uh, to work with, uh, with Ron Lennox, who is the, the publisher of the yeah. Mississauga News. He had a passion for, for history and I think a, a deep-seated love for Bradley Museum because um, he, he had worked for Ken Armstrong when Ken had been involved with the, the initial restoration of Bradley House. And so I, Ron wanted to continue some of that legacy. Sorry. Right. So it was um, tremendous. You talk oh, about, I mean, the, just some of the names that you've, you've mentioned really, you know, champions in the early days of uh, oh, yeah. history yeah. and heritage in our city. Yeah, you know, like Margaret and Bill Lawrence you know, yeah. were stalwart members of the MHF for decades. Um, Marion Gibson, you know, such a kind woman, but every time I am tempted to put shoes on a table, I think, no, no, Marion, <laughs> Share the, the Welsh proverb that somebody's going to be hanged. Right? So, um, yeah. so uh, they're still in my memory and in my heart. You know, oh, very, very good, very get, good. You know, speed ahead many years. Yeah. Um, you know, after Marion's passing, I was giving a, a talk in Brantford to the members of the Brant County Probus Club. And who do I see in the audience? But Eric. Eric Gibson was there, you know. And, um, and then, you know, um, so we renewed, you know, uh, acquaintances and, and chatting before uh, my presentation. Well, then Eric showed up at the museum in Ingersoll a few uh, months after that. So, yeah. so it's kind of nice. I, I, I'm sure that was a day well spent because I can't imagine it was a short visit. So, <laughs> <It's> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful. And, and you know, your, your, your path takes you from, from Mississauga through others to, and now in, into Ingersoll. And, uh, um, wondering if you can give us a, a background on the on the Ingersoll Cheese and Agricultural Museum, kind of how it came to be, and you know what people experience when they visit the site. Yeah, well, it, it's it is an interesting tale. Um, years ago, um, in the nineteen seventies, there was a, a group of people who felt that there was enough history in the Ingersoll area to, uh, to consider a cheese museum. And uh, I don't know all of the, the ins and outs, but I do remember that like, in the 1970s, my parents started a cheese store south of Ingersoll in the village oh. of Stalford. And one day I was working the front counter, I had a conversation with one of Ingersoll's town councillors saying, you know, we should have a, there really should be something like a cheese museum or a museum dedicated to or focused on museum, on cheese. And, uh, you know, okay, you know, nice guy. Well, then a few months or a year go by and suddenly the reporter or the editor of the local newspaper champions this idea for a cheese museum. And so there was a committee formed and, uh, you know, they hired a group of people and really it was a make work project in those days to, uh, to do some research, to interview cheesemakers, to go out and, and approach existing cheese factories to get uh, materials donated. Uh, somebody donated a barn uh, that was dismantled and uh, the town provided space in Centennial Park to erect a replica of a 19th century cheese factory. So that opened in 1977. So, and I was, you know, I was there. <laughs> so, uh, I was in university at those in that time. So like I'm old enough to remember what was going on. And, uh, and I had a 
we went because, you know, like my dad had been a cheesemaker and then got into fluid milk production. You know, mom was running the cheese store and I was helping. So when I was studying Canadian history and Ontario history, um, taking the course with Dr. George Emery, who was originally from Ingersoll, but teaching at Western. And um, so I had done a paper for him on the history of the dairy industry in Ontario. And so um, it was all, you know, meant to, to happen. So, you know, because I, as a kid, had grown up meeting some of these different cheesemakers. Right. Some I would see at their plant when I would go from the store to pick up product that we would in turn sell. Wow. Uh, and what they did on that day was reenact uh, the delivery of first can of milk to the cheese factory. And the guy who was uh, the, the farmer uh, was, a, a, was the town's historian, Byron Genby, because in 1899, he had actually delivered the first can of milk to the St. Charles condensing plant, which was basically like uh, the forerunner to Borden's okay. in Canada. Okay, the Borden company took over the St. Charles Condensing Company where they made, you know, uh, evaporated milk, sweetened condensed milk, Eagle brand, that type of thing. So, so Byron was, was reenacting that, that moment, right? And, uh, you know, and Harry Ellery was the, the guy who drove uh, the buckboard and Harry always had a Dalmatian dog. And so they, they were features, you know, locally in, in town parades and events and so on. So, so like so, so that happened in in August of uh, 1977. And you look back on it, okay, they chose that date because um, in 1866, the mammoth cheese had been launched, and um, so it all kind of coincided. So we go from 1977 to uh, 2012. I am now working at the Ingersoll Cheese and Agricultural Museum. So, so I am now the big cheese. You know, we have the mammoth cheese, but I'm the, the big cheese around the museum. So. I, I, I'm afraid to ask, do you have a cheese hat? This is <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know where to borrow one. <laughs> so, I, um, I mean, one of the questions I had, but I think you've really answered is, you know, why cheese? But you, you, you did mention the, the mammoth cheese, and I wanted to, I wanted to make sure we touched on that because that was yeah. uh, something I, I don't know if it necessarily. I, I think you could say put Ingersoll on the map at least in terms of the beer. Oh, well, absolutely, yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that moment in time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll do that, but before we get there, maybe yeah. you should explain that, like Oxford, yeah, so Salford, Ingersoll, Norwich. That's this is the cradle of the cheese industry in Canada, right? The 1850s, there was um, a, a couple, Hiram and Lydia Rennie had moved here from Vermont uh, in the 1830s and um, they had started, you know, homesteading, clearing the land, uh, eventually ended up owning 700 acres of land. Yeah. And by 1850s, um, they were milking 100 cows a day, all by hand. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge operation in comparison to the neighbors. You know, there was one one guy in, in Salford who would boast, well, between Hiram and I, we own all 101 cows. <laughs> so, so what Lydia would do, would take all the milk and then convert it into cheese, you know, primarily in her summer kitchen. And then Hiram would go from town to town peddling at a different market. You know, it, one year they sold all of their cheese in Guelph. Sometimes it was Brantford, London, elsewhere. Don't think they ever went quite as far as as Mississauga area. But so so that's you know really begins because with you're milking a hundred cows, you need extra hands to physically to, to do the milking. So they would hire men and women from neighboring farms to help with the milking, and then Lydia was teaching them how to make cheese. So really, we think that she deserves credit for operating the first dairy school in Canada. Well, then, um, 
up until this point, you know, everybody's farm wise, they're doing a lot of emphasis on growing wheat. That was the main source of economy. Weather conditions, soil exhaustion all led to some crop failures. And so farmers started to look elsewhere for what they should produce. A lot of them then switched into general mixed farming. So they were having more than one or two cows on the farm to meet their family needs. So then you had all this excess milk, you know, where does it go? You start making cheese. Well, the 1864, there was a guy who came up from New York State. He had been a cheesemaker there and he brought his family up and had convinced the, the Quakers and other farmers around Norwich to go into partnership with him to form the first cooperative commercial cheese factory in all of Canada. And it was aptly named the Pioneer. Now that meant that the farmers were the shareholders in the right. factory. So they provided the, the funds to construct the factory. So every morning there'd be a lineup of farmers delivering these 30 and 40 gallon cans of milk in the back of a wagon bringing it to the factory. Harvey Farrington, the cheesemaker, would bring it in, turn it into uh, to cheese, sell it, and then the farmers got a percentage back based on the volume of milk that they uh, supplied. And right. So, so that was the beginning of the, really, the commercial industrialization of cheesemaking. Well, a couple of years, you know, half a dozen factories starting to operate in around Oxford County. Well, 1866, um, three of those cheesemakers got together. The Rennies were down in Salford, still doing the, the farm style of, of manufacturing, but doing it very successfully. James Harris, who had been one of those young men who had gone to work for the Rennies and had learned how to make cheese from Lydia, had also fallen in love with Lydia's daughter. So he was the son-in-law. Well, he had started a factory on his property. And then just a couple of miles down east of town was George Galloway, who had built a brand new factory in 1865. So I, I think they, they probably met at Rennie's house and started talking about the cheese that they were making. And then they, they identified that they could sell cheese in Britain. They knew that there was a market there. Uh, because of different factors. You know, right. At the time of the Civil War, the, no American cheese was being exported to, to Britain. But they say, well, we're part of the British Empire. We're not subject to any trade embargoes or anything else like that. We can just you know, get, get our product there. They knew that there was a demand because of the growing population in Britain. You know, the English factories just couldn't meet the, the volume of production to supply, you know, a hunk of cheese and a heel of bread as, as a daily consumption for a lot of the, the workers. So there was a need to fill there. But they also recognized that, well, if we send some of our 90 pound wheels, you know, it's like big arms size wheel of cheese to the markets in say in Liverpool, who's gonna notice? Who's gonna pay any attention? It's gonna look like just the other English cheese. So they came up with this really audacious plan to make a mammoth wheel of cheese that was ultimately 7,300 pounds, or a little over 3,000 kilograms of cheese. You know, they manufactured it at what was Harris's factory, packaged it up in its own wooden box, uh, protective box on a heavy duty wagon, it took six horses to pull it. And it went um, you know, down through the, the streets of, of Ingersoll to the train station, you know, then stopped along the way, you know, school choirs, uh, you know, sang to it. The, the, the mayor gave speeches about it. Uh, James McIntyre that you mentioned uh, would ultimately write about it, write a poem about it. And so it went from Ingersoll to the New York State Fair. 
in Saratoga Springs. And that's the only place that it was photographed. And so we have this picture of everybody, you know, lined up on either end of the wagon. And there's about 17 or 18 people standing on top of the, the cheese itself. And well, and it went from there to Liverpool, arrived in Liverpool with great fanfare. Um, you know, they hired a brass band to parade it through the streets. They put it on display and ever the marketers, they, you know, charged the admission to come and see what a 7,300 pound wheel of cheese actually looked like. And, you know, for a little extra money, you got to sample it. So then uh, ultimately, you know, most of it was sold off. They brought 500 pounds of it back to distribute to the, the five men who had done all the physical work of making it. But uh, they also came back with really with a fistful of orders for more cheese. Okay. So we went from six factories in 1866 to 98 factories in Oxford County by the turn of the 20th century. Wow. So, but every five miles down the road, there was a cheese factory that popped up. And so that led to, you know, the entire industry uh, in southwestern Ontario, and then ultimately it branched into eastern Ontario. And uh, because of what they did, okay, that was 1866. They then decided in the following months that, okay, now we've captured the, the British market. Now we have to maintain it. And so the best way to do that was through quality control. So the following year in 1867, the year that Canada was, was created, they formed the Canadian Dairymen's Association and had their first few meetings, annual meetings in Ingersoll. And it was an opportunity for cheesemakers, for dairymen, for farmers, for professionals, for like uh, professors of science, uh, agriculture from Scotland or elsewhere would come to Ingersoll and they would have like a convention of, of cheesemakers. Right. And, um, and so that was a way to keep everybody up to speed on the newest and the latest techniques and trends and developments in the science of making cheese. So that would maintain the, the quality. And so that whole export industry continued for at least 100 years. I, I'm amazed at just the sheer proliferation of cheese factories in such a short period of time, historically yeah. speaking. I mean, that's, you know, just under 40 years, I guess, going from, what, what did you say, six to 98? From six to, to 98 to practically wow. 100, yeah. So uh, it, it, it is impressive, right? When you think about it, um, and that's, it go, again, it goes back to my earlier comment that like Oxford, has been described as the the richest, the best farmland in all of Canada. I, it just it, it's a, it's amazing. And before I lose track of it, what popped in my head was I'm I'm curious. Uh, you know, historically, ninety eight different cheese factories. How many are? Do, I mean, businesses have changed with you know um, larger companies taking over smaller entities and. Uh, Production, but do you still have uh, a presence of cheese uh, cheese makers in in Ingersoll today? In yeah, well, <laughs> everything goes full circle, right? So now we're back to seven. Right? So uh, a lot of it did uh, did change for various reasons. Um, sometimes just the fact that roads improved, right? So it meant that you could transport milk greater distance, right? In the original days, dirt roads. Um, you know, you didn't want to take a risk of spilling your entire day's amount of milk, you know, off the back of a wagon. Well, if the road improved, then you could, all right, we'll go a little bit further, right? Um, and then people started to, to come to the farm and pick up the milk. So that meant that the farmer didn't have to leave the, the farm and so on. So some of these factories then transitioned from making cheese and butter to just being receiving stations for larger dairies, larger companies. Right. Uh, like the like the Borden company that I mentioned, um, they started buying excess milk from the the cheesemakers at some of the small factories, and then you know then the like the fluid industry, fluid milk industry, you know, started to take off as well, and so um, so that that all led to some different. Uh, closures of some of the smaller plants. 
was there was there a particular brand of cheese? I, I mean, cheddar I think is is kind of a a broad name for a group of cheeses. Obviously, yeah. pretty well, cheddar is is one type of of hard cheese yeah. you know, that originated in England, and so it was a cheddar style of, of cheese right. that they started making here in the 1860s, and then you know that uh, trans transition directly into cheddar cheese, right. and that was the the main thing. Um, uh, because of all those 98 factories, then they needed the market. So Ingersoll, the town of Ingersoll became the market town for all those small factories. Everything got shipped there. And so the boxes would all get stamped Ingersoll on it and sent overseas. Well, Ingersoll has uh, still to this day, you know, 20 years later, uh, has a following for cream cheese. Uh, the Ingersoll uh, Cheese Company started off actually as a slaughterhouse uh, and, uh, and then morphed into a uh, cream cheese company. And so in the, um, during the First World War, they were making a spreadable cheese that spreads like butter. That was one of their taglines. Because in the 1880s, maybe even late 1870s, there was a guy in Ingersoll named T.D. Miller. Thomas Dippy Miller, who was uh, an immigrant from Scotland, and he developed what we believe is to be the first processed cheese in all of North America. And it was like a, a ground cheddar cheese paste. Uh, if you've ever had McLaren's Imperial, you can still buy it today in a little red plastic tub in the dairy section in your grocery store. So it's like cheddar cheese that's been ground up so that you can spread it on crackers. Well, he developed a product called Royal Paragon Cheese that won numerous awards at world fairs in Europe and in the United States. And then he taught the McLaren brothers from Toronto how to manufacture it. And then he taught some other guy named Kraft. I, I don't know what happened to him, but, um, but McLaren's, you know, still continues. So that gives you a, a sense of what Miller's first cheese was. Well, as they say, in the First World War, they were shipping um, spreadable, you know, cream cheese to the, the troops in the front line. You now, one of the brand names was Snappy. Right? Again, it had a, an old cheddar as a base ingredient, but you could get it in different flavors like malted or olive or pimento and so on. Right? And, uh, you know, there were little um, what looked like little butter dishes that they would give out as, as promotional pieces for the cheese as well. Yeah. Um, but I, the, the Ingersoll Cheese Company shut down operations in 1996. Okay. And one of their products that I still get inquiries from across Canada, from Halifax to Alberta, British Columbia, where can I buy Ingersoll cream cheese? Okay. So a picture in your mind, cheese whiz, yeah, but something that tasted a lot better. <laughs> and that's not me saying it. This is what everybody tells me. Right? <laughs> but it was um, there was one of their product lines was this processed cheese that you could buy in a jar, and everybody says, "Oh, it tasted so much better than that cheese whiz stuff," um, and that was I'm sure because they were using an old cheddar as the base ingredient. You right. had more flavor to begin with. Fascinating roots to it. So, in the museum itself, um, uh, the I mean, there's a, you've obviously you painted a picture of why Ingersoll is the center of, of cheese production, I guess, or cheese manu cheese marketing. Um, but the museum itself, when people come to the museum today, you, you talked about a dismantled barn that became a a, a, a replica of a cheese factory. But I know that there's other things on site as well. Can you, can you, what, what would visitors see, you know, when we're allowed to reopen in these days? Uh, what would people interact with uh, at the museum site itself? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, cheese is the main draw. Yeah. Draws them in off the highway. Uh, and that's why I've had the pleasure of meeting people from around the world, you know, because they're traveling through Ontario and they see our sign on the 401. But uh, when they come, they're going to learn that we are more than just cheese. 
Um, they tell people that Ingersoll is a town that's been built on cheese, but then there's been a lot of developments that have gone on, you know, before and after, you know, the, the cheese industry started. And Ingersoll as a town was named after Thomas Ingersoll, who uh, was born in Massachusetts, 1749, fought for the Americans during the revolution, but 1790s meets with John Gray of Simcoe at Niagara on the Lake. They strike a deal and with cooperation of Joseph Grant, um, Ingersoll is granted 66,000 acres of land, so basically the size of a township. But he had to bring 40 families with him from Massachusetts, Vermont, you know, the New England states to come and settle in this area of what's now Oxford County. Well, he managed to do all of that, but then, you know, he ultimately leaves this area. And where does he end up? The mouth of the Credit River, right? Running the, the government house in the mouth of the Credit River. So harking back to my days in Mississauga, when you were doing the haunted walks of Mississauga and Port Credit, I got to portray Thomas Ingerson. Right? I might have a picture of you. <laughs> yeah. so, well, uh, some people may or may not realize that uh, Thomas had three wives. You know, not all at the same time, mind you, but he, you know, his, his first wife bore him four daughters, and the eldest they named Laura. Well, when they moved to the Niagara region to, from Massachusetts, uh, they stayed for a while in Queenston while Thomas came up to this area and built his first log cabin. Well, that's when Miss Laura Ingersoll met a guy named Secord and got married. So um, a lot of people are surprised to, to see that connection. Um, so we, we tell that story. Um, we have other uh, exhibits that really appeal to a, to a, a broad specter of or a sector of people in that um, uh, we were a destination on the Underground Railroad. We were far enough away from Detroit on one end and Niagara on the other, so about midway between the two, and far enough inland from Lake Erie that it was a safe haven for runaway slaves. And so uh, they found work and, and places to live in Ingersoll. So we have a display on that. But uh, we've also, they say, I've met people from around the world, including some who've come all the way from Africa to see one particular artifact that we have. And this is a, a baby cradle for Amy Kennedy. Well, Amy Kennedy was born on a farm just south of town, went to high school in Ingersoll, and then at the age of 17, married the Pentecostal minister who was preaching in town. Uh, so Robert Semple. So together they go off to, uh, to China to be missionaries. And, uh, but ultimately Robert dies of fever in China. Uh, Amy gives birth to their daughter, Roberta. Well, as she comes enough people take pity on her to get her back to North America. She's preaching probably all across the Pacific Ocean, all across the continent of the United States, ends up in New York City to meet up with her mother. They do good deeds with the, the Salvation Army and other churches. Ultimately, she marries an American named Harold McPherson. So the world knows her today as Amy Semple McPherson who became probably the most famous female evangelist of the 20th century. She goes to became part of the, the sawdust trail. So gospel preachers who would go from town to town, put up a big tent in the edge of town, sawdust on the grass so that it wouldn't get churned into mud and then preach, right? And then pull up stakes, move on to the next town, do it all over again, spread the gospel. Ultimately, she heeds the calling to head west, arrives in California. It's like she drove 
by herself with her, her mother and her, at this point, two children. Harold, her husband, had filed for divorce because Amy was never home. He'd been abandoned. But um, she arrives in California, as she said, with $10 in the tambourine. And with that tambourine, raised enough money to build the largest domed building in the United States at the time, called the Angelus Temple in the heart of Los Angeles. Still stands today and has now been designated as a National Historic Site. And, you know, she was a faith healer, so she was filling this auditorium that could seat 5,000 people in the church. She was preaching three days, three times a day, seven days a week to wow. pack capacity. You know, his people would come from all over the place to be healed, right? Or to at least to, to listen to her, her um, sermons. She did illustrated sermons because this, this church had a massive staging area. So she would have live animals, full orchestra, huge choirs. So, and it was close enough to Hollywood that guys like Chaplin would come and watch and learn how to stage a show. Right. Um, she established the, the Church of the Four Square Gospel that has gone global. Right? There are churches all around the world that uh, were created because of Amy Simple McPherson. Wow. So we've had people come from Kenya to see the, the they're making a pilgrimage to Canada to walk in the footsteps of Sister Amy. So we get them coming to see this cradle. And Unbelievable. It's amazing when you do the roots back and you find these these origin stories in a, in a sense they're quite amazing it, yeah it has been fascinating for me uh, you know a connection to the clarkson that i've discovered recently was john patterson was um you know local guy grew up outside of ingersoll lived in ingersoll for a while when they went to school became a teacher and then um started studying meteorology, uh, is sent off to India as one of the, uh, um, the meteorologists for India, and then ultimately comes back to Canada, becomes the Dominion meteorologist during the 1930s, 40s, but retires in Clarkson. Okay? So, so uh, John Patterson has this connection to Ingersoll, Oxford County and Peel region. Right? Wow! So, um, so it, it's it is quite fascinating to, to see, you know, sometimes the people who were born here and then moved away, and and went on to great things, uh, and then others who um, you know did great things while they were here. Again, the connections are, are fascinating, and, and I'm sure you just scratched the surface. I imagine there's countless connections and uh, to anywhere that we talk about in terms of local history, whether it be the Peel region of Mississauga or, you know, broader world events. So it's just, you know, fascinating. These, these, uh, these it is. I mean, you know, I can go on and you can edit this <laughs> out if you choose. But um, like one of the, going back to like cheese making, one of the, the first privately operated cheese factories was run by a guy named John Adams. In 1860, he's bringing in his neighbor's milk to be turned into cheese, but he was doing it kind of like Lydia was doing in the summer kitchen. Well, then he expanded. Uh, he hired men to, to go to the farm, pick up the milk, and he, he dressed them in red tunics, red army tunics, so it was a bit of a pizzazz to John Adams' milk products. Well, then he moved from Oxford County down to Etobicoke, and started a, a dairy down there. So he's considered one of the first to actually use glass bottles okay. for fluid milk. Right? So, yeah. And then uh, conversely, uh, the Mercer family has ties to Etobicoke, yes. probably parts of Toronto Township. Well, the Mercers moved to Oxford County to a tiny little hamlet called Delmer south of Ingersoll, but they're all buried in the Ingersoll Cemetery. Okay. Okay. And one of the, the sons was Malcolm Mercer, uh, Malcolm Mercer, who, you know, left here and then went to Toronto, was a, 
uh, law partner with um, uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King's father, John King, uh, and then you know was involved with the uh, I think with the, the Queen's Own Rifles in Toronto. Rose in the ranks to ultimately become a major general in the Canadian Army during the First World War. Oh, and great. Was, yes, I yeah, know that name. Right? Yeah. Big, tall, six foot two yeah. guy with an imposing mustache. Um, and, you know, he was killed uh, in 1916. So to this day, he ranks as the highest ranking Canadian officer to be ever, ever to be killed in action. Because he was one who would uh, go right out to the front trenches to, to get a grasp on what's happened. Right. Right. Well, he's commemorated here in Ingersoll on the family plot. Right. So, so once again, you know, we start to interweave different stories. I, I didn't, I didn't realize that connection. I've, I've certainly documented some of the Mercer family historically here. We have Mercer's buried at, uh, at Dixie Union Cemetery in, in Mississauga. Um, but th that's probably the, I guess, maybe the grandparents of those that came to, to, yeah. to Oxford. Um, but yeah, I actually had never connected the dots of the First World War Major General. And although I'd known that name, I didn't connect the dots to that. So yeah. uh, again, the linkages. Now, when uh, I know that you have the museum site, and uh, in the past, I, I think we've, we've lent some uh, uniforms to you for different programs uh, that, that you've done at site. What are kind of the, some of the special events that you do at the museums that people could, uh, could look forward to interacting with uh, mm. down the road? Well, I the the sky is the limit uh, and, um, we uh, just uh, on the tail end of the first world war connection right uh, we were part of a group in oxford county that put on 100 events to mark 100 years wow. between 2014 2018 uh, we did an average of 20 events per year and uh, that kind of culminated in 2017 with our um, staging of what I called Vimy 100 and uh, that was like we converted the entire museum grounds buildings and the 10 acre park adjacent to us into the first world war and we turned the, the cheese factory into a recruitment station so you could take your oath of allegiance there have your uh, your weight and eyes tested and everything else um, our blacksmith shop was uh, site for the first Hussars cavalry unit. Um, the Oxford County Museum School that's on our site was turned into a French estaminet, a French tavern. Uh, we had quilters who were doing, you know, a fundraising quilt. We had um, care packages being packaged inside the main building. We had a photography studio set up so that you could put on uniforms and take your picture just like those young men who went overseas. Um, we had calisthenics class. We had the pipe band, the Ingersoll pipe band came and we marched around the, the parade square. We had bayonet drills. We created uh, trenches uh, and a sniper's nest. And it uh, culminated in the, the battle for uh, the battle for Hill 290. Mm -hmm. 290 is our street address, so that was the location for the battle. So, so we was there a hill? Uh, oh yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Now there's a large slope that uh, goes up the back end of, of the park. So, okay. <laughs> so the, the British had to march. Basically, it was like marching up Vimy Ridge, right? You know, uh, with pipers leading and, and so on. So. Well, and, and it was neat because we had um, the the Great War plane air. Uh, Airplane Museum in Brampton. Right. They flew uh, their Sopwith camel and, uh, and the triplane overhead. So they had a little aerial dogfight as well. Very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so ultimately, like, we got, to, we were part of the winners for the uh, Dorothy Duncan um, Historical Programming uh, Award issued by the Interior Historical Society. Uh, on a more regular basis, um, we run events like Harvest Fest, uh, which is um, really a celebration of our agricultural roots. So we have different um, farm implements uh, operating or on display, um, local 
vendors, kids' activities, and so on to, to celebrate the harvest. We've been involved with the Dairy Capital Cheese Festival, and uh, our hope is that uh, when restrictions lift, then we'll be able to actually host it on our site. We've been taking an active part um, in its previous location. And, uh, and the Pumpkin Fest is um, an annual event in October, uh, an afternoon event, so like from 12 to 4, and we'll get a couple of thousand people that will come out. Uh, for those short period of time to um, to celebrate pumpkins and all that you can do with it. So, uh, and uh, a popular um, connection again back to my days in Bradley Museum is that uh, we've been hosting Driftwood Outdoor Theater as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you yep. know, I first met Jeremy and his some of his crew at Bradley Museum, and you know, and that was. That was and still continues to be a rewarding partnership. In that, uh, the Bradley Museum, we were getting the largest attendance for driftwood in the entire season, and we were getting people from Mississauga who had not otherwise set foot on the museum grounds. You know, they had no interest in history, but they enjoyed Shakespeare. Right. So we have immediate access to the park directly behind the museum. So Driftwood is able to come in and, and set up their minimalist stage in the park. And, and once again, we're doing Shakespeare Under the Stars. Oh, that's wonderful. That's, I, wonder, I, I, I missed the Driftwood. Uh, Driftwood. We, we had a, an opportunity a couple of times both here in Mississauga and in Brampton to see them. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, just another reason to uh, perhaps make a trip to Ingersoll and spend a day and uh, uh, See if we, when we're allowed to do so, whenever that happens again. Well, that's right. And we've got something for kids too, and that uh, we're the location of Canada's one and only cheese playground. We had uh, uh, the opportunity to work with TV Ontario with a program called Giver and with a local um, community group called Playwright Playgrounds that uh, have made it their mandate to make playgrounds in Ingersoll accessible. Okay. And so what they did was approach some kids to say, if you could design a cheese playground, what it would what would it include? Right. So they came up with all kinds of really cool design ideas. And then the professionals with TV Ontario and then 300 volunteers who showed up over the course of one weekend transformed a flat lawn into this amazing playground of climbers, spinners, you know, wow. stepping stones, uh, sandbox, everything, right? You know, it's, you know, giant slices of Swiss cheese that you can climb through and over and under and, <laughs> and you know, a wheel of blue cheese that, that spins and so on. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, it, it's fun for children of all ages. I was going to say, that sounds like a destination into itself. So Absolutely. amazing, amazing. Um, I mean, just, you know, it's a fascinating, and I, I know this is just a, a, a snippet of what the museum does. And, and uh, it certainly is, you know, a, a must visit when, when, when things reopen again. And uh, just a delightful trip, not only down memory lane, but also into a community that many of our own listeners perhaps haven't had the opportunity to go visit and, uh, and, uh, uh, explore that part of that, you know, the, the history that is so vibrant from another part of, of our province. Uh, so, you know, thank you for that. But early on, uh, I, I did mention, uh, to come back to cheese as a topic, uh, was uh, James McIntyre. And I mentioned a book that we found uh, and, uh, it, from a, 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 an old bookstore about the old queen of cheese. Um, and I thought a little bit of a note of humor in a sense that people are interested in, in perhaps a uh, exploring some of those Ingr Ingersoll cultural connections to cheese. Right. What if you can tell us a little bit about uh, James McIntyre? Well, James, James McIntyre was, was born in Scotland in 1827. And he came to, to Canada as a young man, he was about 1841. And he settled in St. Catharines and Thorold area and uh, developed a trade as, as a cabinet maker. Well, uh, those days, cabinet maker also manufactured caskets. So he became the undertaker as well. 1854, he moved to Ingersoll. Again, there's 
a lot of different connections between St. Catharines and Ingersoll. So there may have been other ulterior motives for him coming here. But he set up a, a cabinet making shop in town. And uh, so he, he ran that really until his, his passing. But James was very much a Robbie Burns man. He um, admired the, the Scottish poet. And so he wrote a lot of poetry himself. Similar in that he recorded local events, individuals, world affairs. Uh, he'd write about pigs and chickens and, and other things too. Um, but he's most famous or infamous for being Canada's cheese poet. Right? Rex Murphy on CBC referred to him as the Milton of Stilton, the Chaucer of cheese, right? Um, because like when he wrote things like the Ode on the Mammoth Cheese, that was to extol the virtues of this giant wheel of cheese that, you know, if were suspended from balloon, folks would think it was the, the moon about to fall and crush them soon. Right? Um, so like his, some of his rhyming, uh, leaves a lot to be desired, uh, but I, mean, I admire him not just from a you know a humorous point of view, but but from his his willingness uh, to to document local events, right? Uh, one, he, there's at least two books that were published of his works, you know, lines on the laying of a cornerstone for a church, or the the death of Hiram Rennie, uh, the who was touted as you know the real cheesemaker. You know Lydia had nothing to do with it. It was all Hiram, right? Um, which is topic for another story someday. But um, he was also when when he did die, uh, he was acknowledged as Ingersoll's greatest student of Shakespeare. And uh, so he was, he was well-versed in that. Um, he was a member of the Odd Fellows Association uh, Club. Uh, he was a, a Mason for a number of years. So um, he was well-known in the area. And I suspect he was, was well enough respected that, um, you know, that he was invited to, to go to special events like when the cheesemakers held their annual convention he was often like a, probably a guest of honor who would then, you know, write a, a short poem about, about the, the dairy industry. So he did write quite a number about uh, cheese making and milkmaids and, and other things. And, you know, um, how you had to feed your cattle good brows so that you'd have good quality milk and so on. Yeah. So he was trying to educate them. Well, in, I guess, 1927, William Deacon, who was at that point uh, a book critic for Saturday Night, uh, compiled a book called The Four Jameses. Okay. And uh, in that, you know, he included James McIntyre and um, three other fellows or people named James um, as Canada's worst poets. Uh, one of them didn't even exist. You know, it was like a yeah. pseudonym for somebody. But um, so that's how James uh, gained somewhat notoriety for his his ability or lack of ability to, to pen uh, a like, rhyme couplet. Like you said, though, I mean, very, very basic of it. He's talking about the local things and the local people who did them, too. And it, I think that's just a fascinating chapter. I mean, if, if, if every community had such a scribe or such a, such a narrator and recorder, I think we'd, we'd, uh, we'd be better off for it. We would, yes, yeah. yes. And that did inspire uh, people in the town to, to create the James McIntyre Poetry Contest. Oh, really? It ran for about 20 years. Um, maybe that's a, a great note for us to, uh, to close on, but uh, you know, I, I really encourage people to uh, to check out your, your website and Facebook and, uh, and and Twitter feed. I know, uh, but you know, the time is coming. Hopefully, fingers crossed, at some point this summer, if not early fall, where 
we will be open again. Uh, people can come visit the museum, uh, see for themselves, you know, explore cheese and all the local connections that Ingersoll has through the museum work. And, uh, uh, you know, I look forward to personally visiting as well. And, and, and my kids are going to love the cheese playground, I think. So, <laughs> so, so Scott, thank you so much. Uh, it has been an absolute treat to connect with you again. It's, it's been a few years and uh, uh, glad to see you're busy and you're well. And, uh, and uh, uh, I look forward to visiting you at, uh, at the Ingersoll Cheese and Agricultural Museum. So thank you so much for joining us. You're quite welcome, Matthew. Look forward to hosting you. Wonderful. Thank you for spending some time with us here at Ask a Historian. Thank you also to Scott Gillies for exploring the story and collections of the Ingersoll Cheese and Agricultural Museum with us. Always a fascinating way to learn about the stories of other communities. We invite you when we're allowed and things are back open to visit this museum down the road and explore all, all that Ingersoll has to offer. It's fascinating to see some of the local connections that came out through our talk whether it be some of the stories of uh, Thomas Ingersoll and his daughter Laura Secord or of Patterson who settled in Clarkson years later. Some of those connections that have a broader connection to North American history and world events. Uh, just a fascinating way to explore the stories of our communities. It's interesting when we look back on cheese making historically here in Mississauga, and, and although we certainly didn't have the amount of cheese production that Oxford County saw, Peel County did have some cheese manufacturing. Uh, and locally here in Mississauga, historically speaking, we had the Stillman Cheese Cooperative out of Meadowville that operated in the early 1900s. And a little bit larger operation was the McKee, uh, uh, the McKay Cheese Cooperative in Elmbank, which operated from about 1900 into the 1930s. Uh, so just, you know, fascinating ways to look at our local connections to a much broader and much beloved topic, that being of cheese. Uh, and so, on the end of this episode, simply say, say cheese, and we'll see you in future episodes of Ask a Historian.